A few years ago, I posted this video about Lagrange's theorem, and in that video I was trying to convince the viewer that the converse to Lagrange's theorem doesn't hold. Today I got a comment on the video from viewer Hannah Lewicki asking whether or not there's another video which explains in which uh, situations the converse to Lagrange's theorem does hold. And so that's what this video is about. So as far as I know, there's no general classification of all groups that um, for which the converse to Lagrange's theorem holds. Uh, however, there are a lot of results that will tell you, well, in this situation, the converse will hold. So I want to spend a little time with some of the easier cases in this video. Uh, first, there is a name for such groups. Uh, actually, there's a couple names. Um, the one I first learned it as uh, was CLT groups. So CLT stands for converse to Lagrange's theorem. So these are groups for which the converse to Lagrange's theorem holds. Uh, another uh, name for them, uh, so I guess you know an alternate name uh, would be Lagrangian groups which I guess makes a little sense when you're talking about Lagrange's theorem, right? So Lagrangian groups are also right, another name for groups for which the converse to Lagrange's theorem holds. Uh, so what would be an example of such a group? Well, I guess maybe the, the easiest example will be the, the cyclic groups. So example, um, let G be a cyclic group of order, say, n. All right, well, since we know G is a cyclic group, then we know it has a generator. So let X be an element of G such that G is equal to the group generated by X. So if you don't know this notation, this is meaning all powers of X. So I here can be any integer. Uh, of course, we're, we're living in a finite group here, so even though this looks like an infinite set, it really won't be. Uh, you'll get a lot of repetitions. Um, okay, fine. So you have some generator, and we want to prove the converse to Lagrange's theorem, so we need some number that divides n. So let's let m be something that divides n. So since it divides n, uh, we can look at the quotient, n divided by m. And so let's set... Uh, y equal to x raised to the n over m power. Okay, so I have this element. This is some element in G, right? Because n over m is an integer, right? Let's write that over here. n over m is an integer because we know m divides n. And if I raise x to it, okay, that's, that's what G is, right? It's all the powers of x. All right, so now let's look at the group generated by y. So these are going to be all of the powers of y. Well, uh, we already know that the order of x is n, which means if I raise x to anything smaller than n, uh, I won't get the identity element. Um, so how big is the order of y? And so I claim it actually has to equal m, which will mean the order of this group is going to equal m. All right, so why is that? Well, let's take y and raise it to the nth power. So this will be x to the n over m raised to the mth power. And of course, these exponents multiply, and I get x to the n. And since g has order n, I know x to the n is the identity element. All right. And of course, if I took anything smaller than m, then I'd be raising x to a power which was smaller than n. And I can't get the identity in that case. So this really implies that y has order m. Okay, uh, so now we, okay, there we go. We, we, we found our subgroup of order m. All right, so the converse to Lagrange's theorem holds for g, right? I.e., g is a CLT group. Uh, can we generalize this? Yes, although it would help if you, you know, have a little bit more uh, background. So if G is an abelian group, okay, I'm talking a finite abelian group, uh, everything is finite in this video, then G is 
ACLT group. All right, so I, I don't want to go through the full proof of this because it's going to use the uh, fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. Uh, but what, what does that tell you? Uh, well, the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups tells you that you can write an abelian group as a direct product of cyclic groups. And so if you want to show that uh, it's a CLT group, you just break up your group into those individual cyclic groups and kind of break up your the whatever number it is you're trying to uh, find a subgroup of that size. You can sort of break up each of those individual cyclic groups into the correct orders. Um, so that's that's a really nice uh, result. So I'll just say this relies on the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. So this is something you might see at the end of a, a group theory course, uh, or possibly when you first get into to graduate school. Uh, although when you get to graduate school, you'll probably see this as a consequence of a more general theorem uh, about finitely generated modules over a principal ideal domain. Okay. Um, at this point, this, this is probably enough for if you're in a first course in, in group theory. Uh, if, um, if you want to go a little bit further, though, it, it is nice to, to see a, a more general picture. So um, there are groups which are called solvable groups. And once you know that a group is solvable, that will actually also imply that you have a, a CLT group. Of course, every abelian group is solvable. So I want to draw a um, diagram of some types of groups. So let's start with sort of a very large, important class of groups, which are solvable groups. So if you don't know what those are uh, yet, you, you should by the uh, end of an abstract algebra sequence. Um, historically, they were uh, very interesting as solvable groups were corresponding to polynomials that were solvable by radicals. Um, but uh, a quick definition is uh, your your group is going to be solvable if you can find a a series of um, what are called subnormal subgroups. So they're going to be normal in the the next subgroup of the series. Uh, and then when you look at the quotient groups, uh, they're abelian. Now that may be well beyond uh, where you are in the course, and that that's that's okay. So just put this in the back of your mind that there's something called a solvable group, and it's a, a fairly large a uh, class of groups includes, for example, all groups of odd order, although that's a, a reasonably difficult thing to prove. Um, so sitting inside the class of all solvable groups is the class of CLT groups, so groups for which the converse of Lagrange's theorem holds. Um, so if you know you're solvable, then for sure, absolutely, the converse of Lagrange's theorem holds. Um, they're not the same. Uh, for example, um, well, we, we know that A4 is a group for which the converse does not hold, and that is a solvable group. Uh, in fact, if you take the, the direct product of A4 with, for example, any group of odd order, which we know is solvable, uh, then this will be a, a solvable group, but it won't um, satisfy the converse to Lagrange's theorem. Uh, sitting inside of this class of groups is the class of super solvable groups. What a great name, super solvable, right? So these are going to be uh, groups for which you can find a normal series. So all the, the, the groups in this, or the subgroups in the series are normal in the entire group um, and which you can get uh, cyclic quotients. Um, so examples of super solvable groups are abelian groups. And of course, we also know sitting inside of the abelian groups, we have our cyclic groups. Uh, now, there is another nice class of super solvable groups, which is going to intersect with the abelians. And those are P groups. So these are groups whose order is a power of a prime. So P groups, of course, sit inside the super solvables, which sit inside CLT. And so we conclude 
that every P group sits inside CLT, right? So every P group satisfies the converse to Lagrange's theorem. And in fact, that's a consequence of what's called the CELO theorems, right? So this P group, right, the proof of that, if you haven't seen it yet, you, you will very soon. Uh, this comes from the CELO theorems. Okay. And, well, I guess it is kind of interesting to note that the super solvables do not make up all of the CLTs. So uh, what you could do there is, for example, take a four and take the direct product with C2. So this is a cyclic group of order two. And then take the direct product with, well, another H, but let this just be any group in CLT, right? So any group for which the converse holds. So this will uh, still uh, let CLT hold. That's kind of nice. Uh, that's maybe not obvious, but a little proof uh, will show it. Uh, it also is not super solvable, uh, and that's because uh, you can take the direct product of H with C2 and then with uh, a copy of A3 inside of here, uh, and that will be a maximal subgroup, but it has uh, index 4. So one of the properties of super solvable groups is that all of their maximal subgroups have prime index. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's a lot more that one can say about these CLT groups. Uh, there's lots of papers in the literature about them. Uh, but uh, for a first course in group theory, it's, it's you know it's probably really good to to know about the abelian case, right? And and the proof you should definitely be able to handle the cyclic case, uh, as well as the p groups because that's going to uh, relate back to your CELO theorems. Uh, the rest of this stuff, right? That, that's maybe more for a second course in group theory, something you might see in graduate school. All right. Well, I hope this was uh, helpful, Hannah, and let me know if you have more questions.